Good morning, Bitcoiners. Welcome to Amsterdam. So, obviously, we're here to talk about Bitcoin and learn about Bitcoin, but it's important to understand what happens, what is the alternative to Bitcoin? What is the plan if Bitcoin is not the future of money? We have a panel to talk about central bank digital currencies. I'm honored to be sitting with three distinguished and very diverse experts in this field. So uh, my name is CK. I am the Director of Financial Freedom at the Human Rights Foundation. And let's introduce the panel. Let's start with you, Efrat. Sure. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Efrat Fenningson. I'm based out of Israel. For the past 20 years, I've been a CMO and marketeer in global companies. And I've transitioned to become an independent journalist when COVID started. And I started seeing a lot of the lies of big pharma, media, government. And because of the media, I decided to try and narrow that gap and try to bring balance to where censorship exists. And that pathway led me to the different lies about fiat system and central banking. And the path from there was uh, quite easy to get to Bitcoin. And so I was red-pilled first, then orange-pilled, and uh, now I'm here. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Willem, and yourself? Um, yeah, Willem Middlecombe, good morning all. Um, I live near this place, but it was a huge traffic jam, so glad to be on time. Um, I, I, I've been an author, I've been an investor uh, for a long time, I've been a journalist. I've been writing about the international uh, financial system since the uh, early 2000s. Uh, wrote a few books. Uh, one of it is The Big Reset, uh, and that, that was translated into eight, la eight, uh, eight languages, uh, Chin Ch Chinese, uh, Mandarin, and Arabic. Uh, I'm also um, connected to the OMVIV, which is a monetary think tank in London. And there it gets interesting because that's, that's the think tank where central bankers and the private sector meet. So I'm not here to defend central bankers, but I do meet them quite a bit. I do understand them a bit, I think. So again, I'm not here to defend them, but I can explain a, a bit how they think about central bank digital currencies and how they see Bitcoin. No, I think that your, your expertise is going to be very insightful here. Freddy, yourself. Hey, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Um, Willem, I'm really glad you're not here to defend central banks. I don't think, you, I don't think it's the best audience for that. Yeah. Um, I'm a lawyer by training, um, so I've worked for many years in the city, been learning about Bitcoin since 2013, and recently uh, co-founded the uh, Bitcoin Policy UK, which is designed as an advocacy group to try and educate politicians, regulators, and the general public in the UK about the advantages and benefits of Bitcoin. And I wrote our uh, rather lengthy submission to the Bank of England, uh, pushing back against their CBDCs in their recent consultation. So, Freddie, you know, obviously, as you try to educate central bankers, one of the most important topics is financial freedom and why that's important. Do you want to tell us about some of that dialogue that you have? Yeah, sure. So I think a really good place to start is actually with what's one of the most famous quotes about CBDCs. If everyone's familiar with a guy called Augustin Carstens, he's the general manager of the Bank of International Settlements, which is like the, it's like the central bank of central banks. And one of the things he said in 2020, I think it was, uh, should really scare everyone quite a lot. Um, he said, you know, the key thing with a central bank digital currency is we will have absolute control over the use of that expression of central bank liability. And what is more, we will have the technology to enforce that. Mm -hmm. And moving from there to understand exactly what a CBDC is, at its simplest, it's basically a permissioned token where the ledger is used and maintained by the central bank and also controlled by the central bank. And the consequence of that is really no, no more complex than to understand that in order to spend your own money, you will need the consent of the central bank. Whether that consent is tacit or explicit, you will not be allowed to spend your money on things the central bank do not want you to spend your money on. And as Christian said, I think that taps into a really, really quite fundamental point about freedom and human rights. The freedom to transact is is not an obvious freedom. We all think about freedom of speech or freedom of association. But without the freedom to transact, my, my view is very much that the other freedoms don't really exist. It underpins all of the others and it enables them to exist. Just taking a couple of random examples, there is no point in speaking freely if I speak freely and then tomorrow I can't buy food for my children. Or if I go to a political rally, 
I exercise my freedom to demonstrate or my freedom of association, and then I suddenly find that I can't pay rent because the central bank have frozen my bank account. And so the, the key issue for me is that the Freedom to Act is like an invisible freedom that enables all the other freedoms to exist, because in many cases they require you to be able to spend money to enjoy them. And if we lose that, we lose all of the others as well. So, Efrat, I think... Right. I want to add to that that we're seeing real-life examples of, of that limitation to freedom in places like Canada with the truckers' convoy exactly. last year, where money was supposed to be sent to the protesters there in order to continue, and it was confiscated by the government, and the only money that eventually got to those protesters was Bitcoin. And then we see an example in Thailand just recently starting a pilot with uh, 10,000 baht, which is $280 for each citizen that will participate in the pilot, uh, saying that you, can, you will get in your digital wallet uh, CBDC, and you can use it within six months in a radius of four kilometers. So, and they start with the very poor uh, levels of society because they want them into the system. They're saying it. They want, it, they want them registered in all the systems. And so they'll try to lure in all the different, you know, very uh, low levels of the, of the population in order to participate in this game that will be heavily controlled, whether it's geographically or what they use the money for, the purpose of the money. They can control that as well with the technology. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that with freedom of speech, in my podcasting, for example, some of my views will not be the most favorite views on the establishment, and they may try to censor me. And so for me, I need more avenues or channels where I can distribute my content. So I go to places like Substack, but recently I um, put my podcast on Breeze Wallet, right, uh, to, to try and start getting monetization through Bitcoin. Um, and so we need to provide some level of, of freedom of speech uh, that doesn't exist today, unfortunately, in all the mainstream um, avenues. I mean, I, I think, it, you know, the fact that uh, money being tied to speech or your speech being tied to your money and, and that element is really frightening about central bank digital currencies. I want to go to you, Willem, and maybe you can kind of tell us, you know, on in your conversations and kind of behind closed doors, how are central bankers viewing uh, both the Bitcoin side of this evolution and then what they're trying to establish with central bank digital currencies? Well, we don't need CBDCs to cancel people and to, uh, well, I've been canceled myself here in the Netherlands by several media because my comments on social media weren't, um, uh, enjoyed <laughs> and um, so so it, we shouldn't point um, to a picture where everything goes wrong when the CBDCs arrive and now everything is fine um, and, and I agree with all comments made and I have the same worries but I'm quite a practical guy and I don't see how we can stop this in any way because we have this huge fight now between the West and the rest of the world, you know, of 140 countries not joining the Western sanctions for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but whether it's China or whether it's Russia or whether it's the EU or the US, all governments want to, ha want to be in full control. <laughs> so there's a common ground <laughs> worldwide <laughs> on a topic like this. So. Um, we can have parties, we can have discussions here and all agree that we should stop it. <laughs> but I'm afraid this can't be stopped. So then you have to ask yourself, how can I prepare, how can I cope myself with this new reality? And, and that's yeah, to be here, to educate yourself, um, to have some kind of money outside the system. And for me, that has always been gold and silver and Bitcoin, which I called digital gold in 2014. And, and I'm still convinced that Bitcoin is digital gold. Um, but stop playing around with all the shit coins. And, uh, <laughs> you know, concentrate your net worth. Um, have, have different portions of your net worth if you're, if you're a bit richer than average. Uh, and be out of the system. Uh, and, 
and you should be very flexible because it might be needed at a certain point to move your, maybe your family or your assets or whatever to Dubai or El Salvador or whatever. You're, you're not sure yet because there are huge changes coming. We're, we're in the middle of these huge changes. And I think this is fourth turning stuff. Every 80 years you have this new cycle. And, and, and during this, these changes, which I call a reset, you have wars and all kinds of conflicts. Uh, so for me, it's all connected. So, if I may, so picking up a point you just made there, Wilhelm, uh, I agree that w we're on rails, these things are coming, um, and also that at the moment it's very easy for, for you to be cancelled financially as well. Um, one of the key dangers, I think, just exploring that area a bit more, is that CBDCs decrease the cost of authoritarian enforcement for government. At the moment, I may have six or seven bank accounts. If the government wants to cut me off from the financial system, they have to write to six different banks. They have to get a bunch of different court orders. With a CBDC, if all of your money is concentrated in one place, it can be turned off with a switch. However, if you do diversify, as Willem said, into gold, silver, Bitcoin, and obviously we would prefer it to be Bitcoin, but you know, we, we understand gold bugs exist and we should be nice to them. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if, if you have diversified, then you actually you turn the tables again and you increase the cost of enforcement for the government. Yeah. If they shut your bank accounts, if they shut off your CBDC, but you can still transact in Bitcoin, then it's much, much harder for them. So I, I think that's an important weapon. And maybe we can explore this in the remaining time we have. Some ideas about fighting back. So. Uh, in the UK at the moment, the Treasury have already admitted that they're going to need new primary legislation to put the CBDC in place. That's a good weapon for us. Laws are hard to pass and they're hard to change, and there are a lot of people that we are identifying in Parliament and in the House of Lords who are going to be on our side and will be fighting against this. So we're going to be reaching out to those people. We need to get them on board. There's, so in terms of the, the bank charter in the UK, Augustine Carstens, again, the guy I mentioned earlier, Reuters reported recently, he is annoyed because most countries in the world have laws that do not currently allow them to create a CBDC. We need to pick at that scab and explore that and make sure that those countries have immense difficulty in passing those laws. You know? And then in terms of you know, a, couple of, a couple of approaches in the UK, potentially in, the, in Europe as well, there are two um, European Convention of Human Rights articles that we could potentially use as you know, legal ways of fighting back against them. Um, Article 8, right to privacy and, and family life. Article 10 is the freedom uh, to exchange information. We'll all know in this room that you know, a Bitcoin transaction is nothing more than sending a message to the network. And it's an interesting legal point. I think there's value to be in exploring whether there's an Article 10 opposition to trying to put these laws in place. So I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic than you, will. I, I think we still can fight. I think they'll, they'll, they'll try and create them, but I think there's a lot we can do to fight them. Yeah, but, but if you want to fight, um, fight in, in, in a smart way, you know, don't become that one lunatic fighting the system no. because <laughs> it, you will be crushed. Yeah. So be smart, be flexible, and, and I think there will always be escapes because this is a, a, a huge, a huge world. And I think we need to add the example of the U.S., where we see a lot of resistance now on the political level. Um, the federal government, there is a bill that just passed with uh, Congressman bill. Emmer, yeah, tr trying to make uh, uh, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, Bitcoin, CBDC illegal mm -hmm. in the U.S. And then we have South Dakota, uh, Indiana, Texas, Florida, all have bills on the table to ban CBDC. So they are, in the U.S., we should take example, trying on state levels and federal levels to try and block this move. Most countries don't have that political awareness, but we should say it so that people know that on that front as well, we can try and resist. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm inspired by uh, the resistance in the U.S. I'm inspired by the resistance globally. It seems as though usually when there's a decree like we're going to do this thing like a CBDC, it's inevitable. Wollum thinks that, you know, these central bankers are highly networked and, you know, I trust his position. But, you know, where I think Bitcoin has the advantage is that Bitcoin is even more highly networked. Uh, Bitcoin can coordinate better and faster than existing financial institutions. That's why it's an evolution. I'm kind of curious. What about Bitcoin well, makes you optimistic? Um, you know, Bitcoin is very powerful. And, and the reason the CBDCs are being developed is because of the success of Bitcoin, because Bitcoin showed the central oh, yeah. bankers, the money printers, 
that you can have perfect digital money. Um, but many people in the Bitcoin community make the mistake to think because Bitcoin is the best possi possible form of money, <laughs> central bankers one day will understand and start using it. But they can't because they can't control it and they will never they will never be willing to lose control over our money system voluntarily. So they will always fight it and they will accept Bitcoin when it's marginal, when it's an alternative yeah. only used by a few. But when Bitcoin becomes too successful, they will crush it. Here in the Netherlands, I can't buy Bitcoin with my bank account, which is connected to my business. You're not allowed to make transactions. So they will close the on and off ramps the more Bitcoin becomes successful. And then the only thing you can do is move to countries where they are not that suppressive and where there's more freedom. And that's why I always say uh, keep uh, getting yourself informed by conferences like this and be flexible and, and make sure you have some money left. You have some spare money. You're able to flee to more freedom when, when needed. So fleeing to freedom, it go, jurisdictional arbitrage, obviously Bitcoin makes it easier to do that with your property. Is that the only answer? I mean, Efra, how do we fight back? Well, uh, I, I, I just, before I answer that, I just want to say that we need to be aware that there is the ability to program the CBDC in order to tell you what to use it for and and they are starting to, to do this already. We're seeing examples of how government is tying money with climate, for example, climate agenda. So Brazil and Australia are already tracking your carbon footprint in your apps. And New York governor said recently that they're starting to track your consumption habits. And they, we may have to have a very difficult conversation about your meat choices, right? If you can eat meat or not. Yeah. Okay, I, like I'm not talking specifically about Bitcoin, but I am because everything that you won't be able to do with CBDC, you'll still be able to keep your freedom with Bitcoin. And then in the last financial summit in Paris in June this year, uh, Emmanuel Macron said, <laughs> we need a financial shock because of climate um, crisis and so they're tying political agendas into money and this is where we're heading and so when we want to fight back obviously the first thing is how do we pull out of that system and start adopting but what I'm saying is now is the money time for Bitcoin adoption for a sharp rise in Bitcoin adoption and this is where I'm calling as a marketeer I'm calling the the Bitcoin community to put the metal on the pedal in order to educate people more because there is a great awakening right now, whether we like it or not, people are waking up for different reasons, whether they understand the government is not taking care of them from a security perspective, from a financial perspective, from a, a health perspective. There are many reasons for people to wake up right now and be red pilled. And this is your time to transition them just like I did to become orange pill because they are looking for ways to protect their wealth, even their hard earned savings. They, they need somewhere to store the value and they are not, most people are not educated about fiat and they're not educated about what inflation does to their money. And people sitting in this room know how to explain that. And this is missing in the general population. So that's something that I'm doing in Israel, trying to raise more awareness and in the world to what is the current uh, monetary system and what can we create instead of that. Um, just exploring that a little bit, Everett, I think what you're highlighting there is that there's a distinction, a, a bit of a tension continuously between what the users of a currency want and the users of a currency tend to like freedom, autonomy, you know, discretion as to what they spend their money on and what the issuers of currency want. And bluntly, the issuers of currency want control, control mm -hmm. of monetary policy and control of you. And those two, those two forces are always in continual tension. Yeah. And Bitcoin is on one side and the CBDC is on the other. 
And I think developing that idea a little, and one way potentially of fighting back, is looking at existing examples of CBDCs in the world. And quite refreshingly, wherever they've been tried, they have so far been complete failures. So the sand dollar in the Caribbean, for example, no one uses it, no one cares. It went offline for something like three or four months. Please fact check me on that. I don't, have, I don't remember the exact time, but it was just offline. Mm -hmm. that's, in, that's intolerable. Um, the e-Naira, I have been inspired by what's happened in Nigeria. Yes. I mean, the government there tried to impose this digital currency on the Nigerian population, and they just stuck two fingers up at them. But, but that's, and that's oh, why... No, no, just developing yeah. an idea. So I think... And then even in, the, even in China, they haven't been able to, to have much, of, you know, much adoption. I think the, the rather self-interested point that we make to politicians is, do you really want to spend a lot of time, money, and effort on something that no one will use, everyone will hate, and is going to cost you a lot of money? At the moment, they don't even have the expertise no. to build these kind of systems within the central banks. But I, 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 well, sorry, I don't agree. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't agree, agree with you either. I've seen demos. Well, like, but like <laughs> you said, Macron said, we need a financial crisis because when there's a huge financial crisis, they'll just send a message to all of you. You can now go to your app store, download the ECB wallet. There's 100 euro there. We'll yeah. all do it. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, but we I need to buy food. Bitcoin. No, but we'll need to buy food. You know. But it's not about us. You know, we are a no. minority. Look at this crowd. It's even smaller than last year. Let's be honest. Yeah. We are a minority. This is not a mass movement. Yeah. And, and, and they are watching us. <laughs> yeah. They are listening to us. But they will change the system so it's acceptable for the 98%. Yeah, they're, they're saying it's uh, cheap, fast, and secure. And you've got to give it to us. CBDC is and will be cheap, fast, and secure. And they will subsidize you with free money. Exactly. Right? They'll give you free money. They'll do all the propaganda and the campaigns to lure you in. They're very good at marketing. Until you try and spend something that they don't approve. Exactly. And unfortunately, I think that, it's what you said earlier, Luke, the, the moment you realize that you need it, you need an alternative, it's probably too late. So one of the things we want to try and do, I think, is encourage people to explore those alternatives before it's too late. Mm -hmm. So that when they shut your money off, when, but, when you've got your free wallet... But never think you can escape the system. You get out yes. of the system. Well, you can move to a very small island and become self-supporting, but, but that's, that's, that's for the fringe. But normally you need to work within the system, but there's always an escape possible within the system. I'm quite... Um, I think you have to be smart, not fight the system. It's good to try to stop laws being made and implemented, which you don't like, but that's part of the democratic system. And otherwise, just be smart. There are always escapes. There are always back doors. So what you're saying is within, within government, within CBDCs, you can always take advantage and find ways to put yourself in a favorable position. I, I would, I'd probably agree with that. Um, the, the area where I'm not so optimistic about CBDCs and I'm extremely optimistic about Bitcoin being a very formidable counterforce that they can't change is looking back at history at other disruptive technologies that have had very similar features to Bitcoin, similar to the printing press, similar to gunpowder, these things that, you know, the king can say no, but it doesn't matter because his head comes after that. So, you know, I, I truly think like the central bankers, the politicians, they're not giving us their best these days. The incentives have put the oldest, the dumbest, the laziest people there. And maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't think that they can compete with this community. Uh, the last note on our preparation for this is humanity finds a way. And for many Bitcoin believers, Bitcoin's almost like this miracle that popped up, just like that intro video said 14 years ago, almost 15 years ago with the white paper. So I'm curious. Let's end this on a positive note. Let's go back to you, Freddie. How, you know, what about Bitcoin makes you optimistic? You know, uh, how, how, why should people feel like, you know, there's hope here given, you know, everything we've experienced the last few years and, and what we're building here with Bitcoin? Uh, well, I think one of the things that gives me hope about it is one of the very few non-polarizing issues in the world. You know, there's, 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 so, there's so, many, so many people have different views and Bitcoin is one of the few subjects where if I can, I can meet a Bitcoin who has completely different political views from me and yet we agree about certain key problems about the world and what the solutions are. And Bitcoin for me has always been an extremely hopeful thing and it, fundamentally it depowers the powerful and it gives power back to you. 
And that's, that, that's, why I, that's why I love it, and that's why you know, I feel hopeful in this fight. Afrat? Yeah, you know where I find hope. <laughs> CBDC is the booster and the accelerator for Bitcoin. That's how I see it. Well, um, you want to give us some sobriety at the end? Or you, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> are you still, uh, are, is there a, a bright side? Well, for me, Bitcoin um, makes you more flexible. So you, your, your wealth, your net worth can be stored partially. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. But Bitcoin makes you, makes you more flexible. So it makes it easy. It's very hard to flee a country by plane carrying 10 kilos of gold. <laughs> it's very easy to flee a country taking your Bitcoin <laughs> yeah. uh, with you because, you know, it's out there in the cloud and you just have to uh, take the right codes with you or the code words. So, uh, uh, and uh, Willem, unfortunately, uh, more and more people have to flee countries these days for various yeah. reasons. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I was shocked. I was in Dubai during the COVID crisis uh, I, I didn't take the facts. I couldn't enter a restaurant or bar here. This is the most liberal city, they always tell me. My mother was born here. I was more free, free in Dubai. Yeah. And, and that, that really opened my eyes. And, yeah. All right, y'all. Well, thank you so much for an excellent panel, everyone. That is all we have for this one. Stick around. There's going to be an excellent talk coming up thank next. You. Thank you. Cheers. Great thank job. You. Great job. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Pete Rizzo, editor of Bitcoin Magazine. We're here at Bitcoin Amsterdam, joined once again by Dylan LeClaire and Mark Goodwin. You just heard a panel on CBDCs, the headline. They're watching us. They're listening. They'll change the system, give us free money. Obviously a big, big topic in the latest edition of Bitcoin Magazine, the withdrawal issue. Mark, I want to go to you. CBDCs, PayPal, stable coins, Bitcoin. What did you hear in the panel? A lot of interesting things. I think there's a lot of uh, implications for the trillions of dollars of highly regulated, regulated stable coins that are about to come to the market. Uh, we're going to see uh, central bank digital currency issued by uh, world governments, and I think it's going to have a big impact on the uh, Bitcoin macro market. Dylan, over to you. Yep, I agree there. I think they're going to try to limit the uh, the off ramps. They're going to try to they're going to try to control the rails. Uh, that's the only way out. With uh, you know the debt the debt levels this high, and they're going to do financial repression, and they're going to try to you know limit the rails. They're going to try to they're going to try to go, uh, right. guard the off ramps. We heard closing the doors. We heard Willem talking about that he can't even buy Bitcoin through the banking system. Is this something we're going to see more of before it gets better, Mark? Absolutely. I think the regulatory regime is just getting started. I think they're gassing up their engine. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, direct legislation and a lot of direct, uh, yeah, as Dylan said, uh, <clears throat> you know, choke points on, on, on these banking systems that interact with Bitcoin. So, Dylan, how are you preparing for something like that just as a person, you know, in managing, you know, not just the finance of, you know, UTXO management, but yourself? Uh, Bitcoin in cold storage, um, you know, if you can get your hands on it, uh, non-KYC Bitcoin, privacy is not a crime. Um, you know, they, they make you think otherwise, but, you know, this is uh, something that everyone should evaluate by themselves uh, and think about because, you know, uh, the blockchain is very much transparent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that's part of the, the KYC regime is part of is all of this in the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe worse before it gets better. Uh, Want to also touch a little bit on what they talked about with the having coming up. Mark, want to throw it over to you. Your thoughts. Does this maybe change, accelerate any of the momentum here from the global participants? Sure, absolutely. I think it definitely accelerates. Um, you know, I think it's a huge narrative. And also there's a, there's a you know, a, a financial change, this relative issuance. Um, you know, we're seeing it really dip below last year. Last happening was a very important one, dipping below, you know, the relative 2% issuance of the dollar and gold coming out of the ground. Now we're going to see that even cut in half again in 2024, lining up right with the presidential election, which, of course, has huge implications on the global economy. Well, we're going to throw it back to the main stage for Macro Trends with Frank Holmes. Stay here on YouTube and Rumble. We'll be live all day here from Bitcoin Amsterdam. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. 
Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.